Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Valerie Spalby. I am a current graduate student at the Colorado School of Mines pursuing my master's in space resources. Um, and yeah, today I'll just be sharing some of the key aspects on my research on high latitude ionospheric electrodynamics during steep events. Um, which has been kind of an ongoing research collaboration since I was an undergraduate. Um, started as part of the Boulder Solar and Space Physics research experience for undergrads, and then kind of has grown from there. Um, and I've been working with Tomoko Matsuo, Liam Kilcommons, and Bayo Galato Court. Um, so this research kind of looks at the connection between steve occurrences and substorms, which is one of active research. Uh, an active topic in magnetosphere ionosphere coupling research. And previous studies have shown that steam events occur at the end of a prolonged expansion phase, um, and that substorms without steve are definitely more common than substorms with steve. So this is indicating that there's some type of a unique substorm that has favorable conditions in which steve can occur. Um, so in this study, we looked at global high latitude ionospheric response during 64 substorm events, both with and without Steve, in order to identify key electrodynamic features that were unique to just Steve events. So we looked at 32 Steve events and 32 non-Steve substorm events occurring through the years 2008 to 2018 and performed a comprehensive analysis of ionospheric convection patterns utilizing the Assimilative Mapping of Geospace Observation, or AMGO, procedure, um, which combines ground-based plasma drift data and ground-based magnetometer data. These AMGO results are then further analyzed with principal component analysis and superposed epoch analysis. Um, so, so for more information and details on, on this study, um, including event selection, and the methods and results. I've included a preprint link to the paper I'm currently in the submission process at JGR. But some of the main key points um, of this paper includes a trend that we observed in AMGO global convection maps of Steve, where the Dawn cell was prominently extended into and sometimes even past the uh, pre midnight sector in the vicinity of subauroral latitudes. Um, this is shown in the plot of a Steve event on the right occurring on August 24, 2017. Um, and in that plot, it also is showing the approximated location of a Steve optical emission in terms of magnetic latitude and magnetic local time. Another key finding of this paper was that larger cross-polar cap potential drop values and a more prolonged night side asymmetry was observed in the ionospheric convection maps for Steve events compared to non-Steve substorm events. And future work kind of related to this study would involve investigating global high latitude ionospheric electrodynamics during subaural polarization streams, subaural ion drifts, and set events, which are all kind of related, and identify key electrodynamic features that are unique to just Steve um, and see if we can answer this question. Are there distinguishable features in the global convection patterns between SAPs, SEDs, and Steve events? Um, briefly, I'm also just going to talk about some of my other projects and research I'm involved in during this sem semester. Um, they're mostly graduate level engineering and design projects. One of them uh, is at CU Boulder, where I'm a professional research assistant for the graduate course, um, assisting a group called FLARE that's looking at falling aerogel atmospheric research experiment. Um, and this is a suborbital research payload design project that's focused on designing and prototyping aerogel housing units that would uh, hold a miniature remote sensing suite of instruments. Um, and then also prototyping the ejection system that would dispense these aerogels from a commercial suborbital vehicle. And this is for the purposes of studying hard to reach places um, of our atmosphere starting at about 100 kilometers in altitude. Uh, and then at the Colorado School of Mines, where I'm pursuing my master's, I am in the graduate design course working on the NASA 2023 Big Idea Challenge, uh, which is designing a metal production pipeline on the moon. 
Um, so from extracting the metal and processing it to creating structures um, and tools. And that team is called the Lunar Alloy Metal Production Plant, or LAM. Um, and that's all I had to share for you guys today. I'll take questions with everybody else at the end, but thank you for listening. Thanks, Valerie. That was great. Um, all right, moving on. Alexa, it's your turn. Are you ready? Sure. Awesome. Um, I don't think mine's as pretty as Valerie's, but that's okay. <clears throat> so, uh, hello. I'm Alexa Alexandra Rosnovo, and I'm kind of actually newer to the group. So I thought I'd give my like a brief introduction um, in that I just graduated from UCLA in the spring, uh, having major in astrophysics and atmospheric and oceanic sciences. And I have been working now the last two months about at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And there I'm working in the ISR1 division, uh, which tackles uh, topics in space sciences and applications. And uh, the work I've been doing there is really exciting, at least to me, uh, but very preliminary, uh, kind of plotting and learning to manipulate data sets from the Van Allen probes right now. Uh, so um, it's going to be very interesting, but it's a little bit too nascent for me to talk about it during this time. So instead, today I wanted to focus on the work I've done over the last year and a half at UCLA uh, that I will be presenting in person at AGU uh, 22, which is now in a month. And the, yes, I mean, uh, Vince already dropped the info, but the session is nonlinear wave particle interaction, the Earth's magnetosphere four. <laughs> and after AGU, I will also be in attendance at the Themis Artemis uh, specific meeting. So, kind of just wanted to give a very broad overview um, or more so a sneak peek of what I'll be talking about at AGU. And so what my studies have focused on and accordingly the title of my presentation is on electron precipitations as driven by interplanetary shock impact on the Earth's magnetosphere. So for anyone not familiar, an interplanetary shock is, or an IP shock is a collisionless shock produced when a fast stream of solar wind overtakes slower solar wind ahead and collisionless, just referring to there being no physical or direct colliding of the particles, but rather these energized particles are mutually influencing one another through um, electromagnetic forces. And when an IP shock like this uh, impinges upon the earth, when it impacts the earth's magnetosphere, there's often a resultant compression of the earth's magnetosphere. This can then result in the generation of electromagnetic waves and then later on uh, precipitation of energized particles. And so diving into this type of event for my study, uh, it ultimately ended up functioning as the kind of comparative case study of two distinct IP shock events, which um, both initiated by an IP shock and then ultimately characterized by augmented electron precipitation uh, after having made impact, but in the middle having very distinct forms of evolution uh, and the physical processes that led to the precipitation. And um, looking at these specifically, one being more defined by electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves or emic waves, and then having precipitation occur on the dust side or the side away from the sun uh, at that moment in you know, shadow, while the other one uh, indicates the occurrence of Whistler mode waves and resulted in day side precipitation. And so the kind of really, maybe not as novel anymore, but I think something that made the study really compelling is the, relatively new uh, potential we have with all the satellites in space that are able to measure these types of geomagnetically relevant parameters, uh, looking at different satellites in different moments in different regions to create a fuller story of what exactly happened um, as this in event in its entirety from the IP shock arriving to the precipitation, everything that occurred and trying to characterize and uh, distinguish 
why there are different ways that these events can evolve. Um, so I've included some figures from one of the events specifically, the uh, March 6th event, just to show how the basic idea of following this event through its stages. And so here from the very beginning, when the IP shock arrives at the miniosphere, seeing increases in um, the interplanetary, the interplanetary magnetic field or IMF, as well as the energy of uh, solar wind particles and the velocity. Um, and this is from Themis-C, which was in the solar wind at this time, able to observe the shock before it arrived, but it's kind of impending approach. Uh, and these figures show how uh, just kind of the shock wave would arrive and the way it would compress the magnetosphere. And then, um, you know, continuing to follow the impacts of the shock, seeing uh, another one of the Themis satellites, but this time Themis A, which was um, in the magnetosheath area at the time, seeing different crossings of the magnetosheath and uh, compression as indicated by changes in the magnetic um, composition there, as well as the um, velocity and density of energized particles. And then uh, finally, uh, once we get to precipitation, being able to observe the very you know, augmented uh, loss of relativistic electrons through Elfin. Um, kind of here, you can see the this is precipitating over trapped electrons. And so these very distinct um, intensifications of the loss of electrons. And um, there are some additional satellites used during uh, in my study, there's GOZAR and ERG, and developing a fuller picture of these two events and understanding what really incited them. Um, and then just include the precipitations can, you know, lead to the loss of electrons, uh, which can then, you know, in certain auroral zones, impact the atmosphere, excite molecules there, lead to aurora related to <laughs> aurorasaurus. But yes, this uh, looking at an event that's a bit further out from Earth, but kind of grounds eventually. Um, and yeah, that's what I'll be presenting on at AGU. So. Sweet. Great presentation. All right. Moving on, Karina, it's your time to shine. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Sweet. Sorry. <laughs> Sitting by the fire because I forgot to turn the heat on in my apartment. <laughs> All righty. Let's see. Share that real quick. Have to hide those. Okay. Let me know if you can see it. Looks good. Perfect. All righty. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Karina Alden. And uh, unlike everybody else, I am no longer a student. Um, I am a space weather analyst, so early career uh, scientist at this point. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to and uh, what I'm doing now as a space weather analyst. So in November of 2020, so two years now, which is crazy, um, I joined the Moon to Mars Space Weather Analysis Office. Um, I am now a space weather analyst on the team. Um, and then during this year, these years of working as a space weather analyst, I've had the opportunity to do some outreach, um, including speaking to my high school, uh, uh, their radio station wanted to do a little space weather segment. So I got to talk to them about space weather. Um, I also talked to a local school ca called North County High School um, and was able to speak with the students about space weather as well and impacts, although they were more interested about my height for whatever reason. Um, and then I gave an alumni talk to uh, my college, the which is Linden State College. It's now no, known as Northern Vermont University at Linden um, up in Vermont. And uh, I was talking to their AMS and did NWA club um, about what I do now. And then uh, more recently, I started working um, with the heliophysics communications group at uh, Goddard as well as the outreach team. So I'm starting to get a feel for what it's like uh, to do communications at Goddard. 
um, which does include the NASA Sun Science pages on like Twitter and uh, Facebook and all that jazz, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, my daily activities, more so what I do on the day to day, include monitoring real time space weather. So this is kind of an idea of what we look at. So every day um, at 10 a.m. on weekdays, we give a uh, space weather tag up to the scientists at Goddard and anybody who else who uh, reaches out to tag in. This one is open to the scientists at Goddard. Um, and so we get to give a tag up. Um, and in this room specifically, this is called the wow room. Uh, Liz got to see a presentation there recently. Um, and then uh, we also analyze events, including uh, CMEs, um, solar flares, solar energetic particle events, L1 arrival signatures, arrival signatures at stereo A or other locations, um, and just basically any, any space weather you could think of um, I get to work with. Um, and then all of these details that we analyze end up going into the uh, CCMC donkey database. So this is where um, any CMEs we analyze end up going into Donkey. And Donkey is like a one-stop shop of where you can see uh, any CME events. And as you can see with this event, we have um, not only CME analysis, there's uh, some flare activities as well that were associated with this event and a solar energetic particle event um, that you can see from this one. And then uh, what else I get to do after all of the Donkey information. Sorry if you can hear my cat eating in the background. <laughs> um, I am uh, very fortunate that uh, the work I do uh, is uh, hopefully going to help the Artemis mission. So the Moon to Mars space weather analysis team that I am a part of um, was created to support the space radiation analysis group in uh, Johnson Space Center. And so basically any work that I do is in support of the R to O to R framework. So we're kind of the two in the R to O to R. Um, so CCMC um, works with all of the models. And then uh, my team, the M to M team gets to work with um, using those models and transitioning them to a real time framework so that we can use them and see how they would work in real time. And then SHRAG implements them in real time. and. Um, I know that SWPSI is also looking in, at implementing some of these real time as well. Um, but with that said, uh, all of this is pretty much in hopes to help Artemis, which I will be switching to night shift tomorrow night in hopes that we get a launch on Wednesday morning. Um, just checking my notes here, making sure I didn't miss anything. I think that's it. Mine was pretty quick because I don't have a bunch of research to tell you guys all about. So <laughs> if anybody wants to connect with me and has any other questions, feel free to connect with me there. Um, I am on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, and those are my email accounts if you have any questions. Sweet. I think you have uh, my dream job right there. <laughs> sounds pretty, sounds oh, pretty cool. We are hiring. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to reach out to you after this then. yeah yeah definitely do that's awesome all right well saving myself for last i guess i will go next oops that is not that is not the title slide there we go i gotta get rid of this zoom bar that's annoying okay give me a sec sweet there we go everything look good sweet awesome all right, well, my name is Vincent Ledvina. I am an Aurorasaurus ambassador, and I will be starting my PhD, my first year in grad school next spring at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, studying space physics. And I've been up to some interesting things the last year. Specifically, uh, this summer, I was doing an internship at Predictive Science Incorporated, PSI, with Dr. Erica Palmerio on forecast or not forecasting modeling coronal mass ejections with a model called Osprey. So basically the gist of all this is that normal CME models and operational CME models for that matter only can predict the arrival time, speed and density um, mainly of a coronal mass ejection. But with this Osprey model, which has been developed by Christina Kay at NASA Goddard 
and is an open source model and it's very lightweight. It can be run on any computer essentially. Uh, you can forecast the magnetic flux rope inside of a CME. So if you're an Aurora chaser and uh, you wanna know if, this, if a CME is gonna have a very strong BZ South component or if you're a, if you're a satellite operator and you wanna know what's gonna happen to the Earth's um, thermosphere, if, you know, if it's gonna expand with the CME or something like that, uh, this model can, with some degree of accuracy, give you that information through the magnetic flux rope. So this Osprey model has been out for a number of years now, but the sensitivity to its input parameters has not really been, uh, has not really been studied. So what we did was we looked at two of the input uh, parameters for the CME model, which was the potential field source surface PFSS model and the input magnetogram. And I'll be explaining that here. So this is kind of the workflow that uh, we ended up with um, for this study. So we started out by identifying events. So uh, what was interesting about this internship is just due to the funding, we had to use Parker Solar Probe. Uh, so we first looked at um, the Parker Solar Probe data and found ICME shocks in the data. So I just looked at a movie and that played over a certain number of years. And I found all of the CMEs that looked good and that didn't have bad data. So we took those and then looked at uh, stereo and uh, earth-facing chronographs. And we wanted to find four events, and we wanted a mixture of events where we could uh, see the CME on the earth-facing disk, we could have a CME on the backside of the sun, and also on uh, only in stereo A's view, because that the location of the source region of the CME affects how the magnetogram looks. So this CME model in particular, and a lot of CME models for that matter, use magnetograms and a potential field source surface model to model the deflections and rotations of the CME as it leaves the sun's atmosphere. So when a CME erupts from the sun, it has a source region, which is often a sunspot or a filament or some kind of active region. And then as it transitions through the sun's corona, it'll rotate and deflect and twist according to the magnetic fields around it. So how you get those magnetic fields around the CME in the sun's atmosphere is through something called the potential field source surface model. And that's generated off of the magnetogram. There's also different heights at which you can generate that potential field source surface model. And sort of the gold standard for that is 2.5 solar radii. But we didn't know whether 2.5 was the best, would be the best option or not. So what we did was we took the events that we found, we found four events, and we selected four magnetograms. So we have HMI synoptic, HMI synchronic, gong zero point corrected and gong adapt realization number 10. That's at the bottom here. You can see the four magnetograms for event two. And they look slightly different. As you can see, there's different ways it could be rendered. And then we selected 16 uh, PFSS heights. So we rendered the PFSS models at 1.5 solar radii all the way up to three. And we, so that ended up with four magnetograms and 16 PFSS heights, so 64 models per event. So 64 times four is 256 Osprey runs. So you can see at the top left here, that's event two. You go down, here's all the input parameters for the Osprey CME model. That's literally how it looks. And it's, it's just a text file and you call uh, the Osprey.py, it's just a Python file uh, in your command line. And it takes that input text file and it spits out uh, something that looks like the two uh, right-hand plots here. So these two right-hand plots is kind of uh, what kind of what we were going for. Uh, the top one is uh, solar wind parameters. So there's the BT total magnetic field, and then all the different uh, RTN components, the vector components. Then you have velocity, density, and temperature. So as you can see for this event, uh, Osprey did kind of an okay job, kind of not at modeling the CME. But what's important is that you can see the different discrepancies between the, all of the magnetograms and potential field source surface heights. And that's most clearly seen at the bottom. The bottom just shows you the deflections and rotations of the CME through the corona. So that's like the first part of the model. Then the second part uh, propagates that CME through interplanetary space. And then it hits the spacecraft and generates the plot you see above that, panel B. So as you can see, we found lots of different uh, changes with the PFSS height and magnetogram used, uh, which resulted in this plot on the very right here. I'm not going to go into the specifics, but uh, the gist is that 
the PFSS source surface height and the magnetogram that you input into a CME model is very important. And depending on where that source region is, different magnetograms might work better or worse um, than others. So like, for example, if it's if the CME is originating from a, from a source on the uh, western side of, or the, sorry, the east limb of the sun, just due to the way the synchronic magnetogram is stitched, it's going to be using data from the last solar rotation. So it's not going to be as accurate as a synoptic magnetogram. But there's all these different standards when it comes to CME models and magnetograms and PFSS source surface heights used in Osprey and then in, also in other CME models that it's important just to have some sort of benchmark and standard uh, basically telling people, hey, this is what happens if you try and vary these things. So we're hoping that this, this study can be translated to other CME models as well, sort of like Enlil. Um, and you know, as, as, as Osprey gets more advanced, we're planning on doing further studies with more magnetograms and more PFSS source surface heights. So, uh, this is going to be uh, hopefully published soon. We just submitted the paper last week, but uh, it's also going to be in one of my AGU uh, posters. Uh, just really quickly here, uh, I've been up to some other things as well. So the main thing is that NODAC, the North Dakota Dual Aurora Cameras Project, uh, received a $100,000 NASA EPSCOR grant this June. So uh, the PI on that is Professor T uh, Dr. Tim Young and Dr. Elizabeth McDonald and Dr. Wayne Barkhouse are co-PIs on that. Uh, there's really great things coming with that project. We're installing a second camera at the Nueta Hydassus uh, College out in Western North Dakota and partnering with them. And we're founding a Zooniverse style citizen science project to not only identify nights where there's aurora being seen, but also uh, classify those aurora. Also, I recently attended the Aurora Summit and Steve workshops, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the Steve workshop in particular uh, was, was amazing and heard from from some great scientists uh, who are actually on this call now. So uh, yeah, that was, that was a great, really, really great conference out in Boston last month. Um, I was able to be involved with two decadal uh, survey white papers uh, that, I, that I first authored and those were submitted successfully. That was a really great effort and opened my eyes to sort of how that all works. Um, starting my PhD at UAF in January, I currently live in Alaska, but I'm down here in Wisconsin right now. And also, I'm an Aurora chaser. That's that's how I uh, came into the Aurora Source community. And I just released an Aurora time lapse film, which uh, I invite you all to check out. The URL is just tinyurl.com/slash Aurora movie. It's pretty simple. So, oh, and here are just some Aurora photos from recent uh, that I shot up in Alaska and also in Churchill. All right, that's it. I think I just barely went over time there, but um, yeah, now that I've wrapped things up, we can go through and if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, put them in the chat and hopefully I'll get to everybody. Thanks. And I see Laura has her hand up. So Laura, why don't, why don't you take it away? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was wondering if, uh, since, since I don't have a scientific background, um, I was wondering if each of our panelists today could give me a um, quick upgoers, plain language summary elevator speech of your resource or of your research. Quick upgoer of our research. Yeah, it doesn't have to be exact, but tell me, tell me in, I don't know, a couple of sentences at a very basic level, what is it that you do? Sure. I guess I can try and take a stab at this so for the osprey stuff i would say we are uh testing the sensitivity that's probably not an upgoer word testing you can, you say can sensitivity. judge the upgoer it's okay 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 testing testing the sensitivity of a model that predicts where things from the sun go in space cool thank you so much and I was wondering if the others could do as well. Thank you. Um, so I'd say for mine, looking at the sun as like a wind of particles, it has, it, it's producing a wave that hits the earth and the earth has its own field of particles. It compresses this field and that leads to more waves and the particles on earth 
precipitate, which really just means that they are coming out of where they were stuck and where they were contained before. So characterizing this whole process, which starts at the sun and ends um, kind of leaving the realm of space and coming into the earth atmosphere. Thank you. And Alexa, what do you hope to learn from that? Um, well, I think it's, I think there's like multiple things that can be really insightful for understanding why certain events behave the way they do. The idea is that one shock could lead to waves in different areas and different types of precipitations. And this just all then connects to, you know, the idea of geomagnetic storm importance and how that can affect satellites. And I mean, in terms of knowing where Aurora will occur. Uh, so I think it's just good to characterize, uh, you know, better understand why things are happening in certain locations at certain time intervals in certain ways. Thank you so much. That's awesome. I, I really appreciate that. I understand it a little better now. Um, okay. Valerie and Karina. I can try to, yeah. So I think um, summarizing, it's really looking at global maps to find features that are distinct to um, different types of subauroral events um, that are not as well understood yet. Um, and hopefully these global models and kind of getting a global perspective can help get, give us more insight into what these not as well understood subaural phenomenon, um, what's causing them. Awesome. Thank that you works. so much. <laughs> that, that definitely made a lot of sense. Thank you. And Karina. So I stare safely at the sun all day. Um, <laughs> I wait for it to change. If something changes and it looks important, <laughs> I will look harder at that. And then <laughs> I will note that in a, uh, online system. And then I will send out an email to people who need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karina. I am I am totally looping all four of you into Upgoer next year. <laughs> You've been awesome. Great. <laughs> you guys did great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thanks. All right. So I guess I already see some questions in the chat. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask over uh, Zoom, just raise your hand and I'll get to you. I guess we can do it that way. Uh, Christian just asked a question for Alexa. Alexa, were the events you looked at purely from one source of IP shocks, say CIRs, or was there a sampling of other events, say ICMEs? Yeah, um, so the IP shock uh, origins were kind of chosen non-discriminately, so they're not, um, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, I think we did look into the sources, but it wasn't as important as to just there being an IP shock uh, and then having it, um, because we were able to identify a lot of shock events, but then you'd have, you'd see it at one point and then the satellites wouldn't be in the right place to track it the rest of the way. So getting one where you could see it at every kind of aspect of where it was at um, was more challenging than one would think, I believe. And so the IP shock origin itself, yeah, wasn't really considered that prominently. Sweet. Yeah. Carlos, I see you have your hand up. Yes, hi. Great job, all the presenters. I have a question for Valerie. I'm pretty sure that's in the paper, but just if you can tell us uh, any characteristics of those substance events related to the kind of uh, speeds that you observe, like, for example, the, the length of the duration, were they related or there was no relation? Um, that's a good question. The duration of the actual like substorm events um, was something that we looked at statistically and duration of Steve events that kind of occur within um, starting at the end of kind of a what we're calling expanded expansion phase of the substorm. Um, and in terms of like the duration of the substorm, those weren't directly compared because there was so much variation, but the strength of the substorm um, and then 
kind of the onset time of the substorm in terms of UT time and in terms of um, the month um, and, and year. Uh, we're also kind of one-to-one -one compared with Steve event substorms, if that makes sense. So timing of the substorms was so variable between the two um, subsets of both the non-Steve and the Steve substorms, but magnitude and um, timing in terms of when the actual substorm started, onset timing um, was, was used in the study. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, Karina, I have a question from Liz here in the chat. Can you say more about your outreach and comms, especially might there be ways to work in some citizen science mentions? Yeah, so um, I only just recently joined them, so I have no idea. <laughs> um, but probably, I know that they've been doing some work with uh, citizen science stuff already. Um, so the comms team I'm working with is the heliophysics comms team. So they're all of heliophysics um, in terms of the NASA entities. So um, not just Goddard, but other NASA facilities. Um, so I'm not entirely sure, but I would love to, like, if you have ideas, feel free to chat with me and I'm happy to send them their way. Um, I know that a lot of the stuff that I'm working with on with them is like more specifically social media. So a lot of their social media posts lately has been what I've been um, kind of shadowing. So cool, cool. Yeah, I was thinking about social media because I have talked to some of the comms folks and there is uh, sometimes interest in sharing Aurora photos, but especially the ways to do that quickly, they are not quite as well set up for that. And I was kind of thinking because you are connected to both of our communities, there might be something there. Um, and also like if you're going back to Vermont, there are such good connections to um, Aurora and uh, the next eclipse is there too. So um, if you ever want to uh, yeah, get those folks. I, I imagine that they are interested in Aurora. I imagine everyone's interested in Aurora though. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Alexa, I just wanted to respond to one of your questions. Uh, you, you were asking if there's a well-known database slash website for identifying Aurora events for specific date ranges. I know that the Aurora source site does have a function where you can go back in time and uh, look at specific dates. So if you're looking for uh, coordinating auroras with certain events that you're seeing in the satellites and things like that, you can always go back on the Aurora source site and look. Uh, I think it's just the top right. You can go and pick the date. And if you're looking at a certain date and there's no um, Aurora reports from that date, I guess you could always ask Facebook. Uh, and sort of the online communities or Twitter and see if somebody has Aurora photos from that date um, as well. So I know Michael has been doing that with his uh, Steve, Michael Hunnicol has been doing that a lot with his Steve uh, observations and his database and that, and he's gotten a lot of great feedback from the Aurora chasing communities online. Okay. Yeah, okay, cool. and, and if I could just add a tiny bit more to that, but thank you, Vince. Um, the, uh, because I've worked with the, you know, what you have is magnetospheric satellite data. So way out in space, they've sensed these kind of emic waves and um, and the whistler waves. And the whistler waves, um, actually, I was just about to say it wrong. So it's late in the day. Forgive me if I say it wrong, are uh, associated with the pulsating aurora, right? And the emic waves more with maybe some other kind of like, weird aurora so um it, it, you have very special events where the satellite has some data and so there might be some great um conjunction possibilities uh from looking at those kinds of aurora too but yeah especially with the pulsating aurora it might be particularly good nights for that or maybe not sometimes you get lucky with that though Okay, awesome. That's all super helpful. I've never actually utilized, I think, Aurora Source like as a tool and resource for that uh, stuff yet. So, like, <laughs> kind of hidden plain sight, 
slip my mind, but I'll definitely check it out. And that's all really helpful. So thank you. Yeah, and I used to do emic waves and whistler waves and all those things more too. So great. I just saw a question from Christian here in the chat for me. And to answer that, um, there's really no uh, overarching global trend for the PFSS source surface heights. So sort of the gold standard that has been adopted in many studies with CME models is, uh, okay, yeah. So the question was, uh, there was there a particular range or value of PFSS heights that were used for the models that seemed to produce more accurate trending data when compared to the actual data measured? So like I was saying, uh, the gold standard has been 2.5, and we've realized that 2.5 is not always the best. So that's sort of the conclusion that we've drawn so far. Uh, but we we really need to have better statistics, more robust statistics to identify trends, because what we're seeing just with four events is that um, it's it's really spread out all over the place. And also the location of the source region affects how the PFSS source surface height uh, you know, affects the model. Also, whether it's close to the what's called the heliosphere current sheet, uh, which is where the sun's polarity flips from positive to negative, uh, based on where that is. And also, if there's coronal holes, uh, that could affect it as well. So these are just theories right now. But in a follow-up study, we're going to um, sort of address that with more robust statistics. OK, Liz just asked, is Osprey run in real time? And um, if you mean real time as in Oh, I guess you can you can run it um, however you want. So it's just it's just a program, and you can you can put it you can put all the input parameters in. I guess the problem is that it's it you you have to physically get those input parameters. So you can get those from CCMC, um, but I'm not sure if the model maybe in some other application it's been run run in real time. But uh, to my knowledge, I don't think it can be uh, right now. But I think. It's tried, I think they're trying to incorporate it into the into the system where it can just pull all that information from servers and get a model like that automatically. Right now, we're just doing it all by hand because it's all past events. Right, but when you say you can just get it and do it, you kind of mean if you're a scientist who works at pr predictive sciences, right? You don't mean it's actually open source. It is, it's on GitHub. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you Google, just Google uh, Christina K. Osprey, I think it stands for open source package, open solar physics, rapid ensemble information or something. Uh, if you Google that, the, the GitHub's right there and there's like a tutorial in there and a readme text file and everything. It's really cool. And there's like, a, there's like example events too that you can run yourself. All you need is Python. And Osprey is one that's like, it's not the, it's a fairly simple model. That's like the kind of toy model or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah, Osprey is pretty simple. Um, what's cool is that it can be run on very limited hardware. I know Enlil, the model that Noah NASA uses, has a magneto hydrodynamical aspect to it where you can model the flux rope, but that has to be run on a supercomputer to be done in real time, essentially. Uh, but Osprey can be run in 10 minutes on a standard home computer. All right, one more question, if there is one. Otherwise, I'll close it out, give you guys a couple minutes back. I'm not seeing any here in the chat, so. This was super, super, super fascinating. Can I ask for like one more quick like, yeah. I was thinking of Karina, but maybe you guys all have a quick answer of like, what's the most fascinating part of what you're working on or weird or something fun like that? What do you enjoy the most? Because you're all doing lots of different things. So it's hard to decide, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just whatever comes to mind. Just curious. Um, I guess the coolest thing about the research I'm doing is it's possibility to be impactful for space weather and other space weather models in the future of space weather models. Something that has always been really cool about my research to me is that it was a feature that was kind of brought to the scientific community from citizen scientists and citizen observers. Um, so I just think that's 
and pretty recently. So it's cool to be um, learning so much kind of as a group all together as a community. Um, so that's been, I guess, my favorite part about doing research on Steve. Um, I can say, I think I already kind of suggested this, but I've really found it interesting in my study being able to look at, you know, as opposed to maybe like science where you're looking at like a very specific physical phenomena and you just look at a bunch of that physical phenomena or yeah, it's more statistical or kind of like specific, the way that it's evolved such that I'm looking at one very prolonged and kind of extended event at all these different parts and you know kind of recognizing like oh the satellite was here at this instant and i'm looking at a different place a different time and it you end up looking over like an entire day at a bunch of different signals of the event i think it's really interesting because i mean it's such a unique perspective to have at the stuff that's pretty abstract to begin with in terms of like the solar wind and charged particles but you can see all these indications at a bunch of different places. So I, I like kind of the story aspect of it, I guess. I don't know what to say. <laughs> oh, um, you love it all. That's why I wanted to know which part you love the most. Um, <laughs> you don't have to say you love it all, but. <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know. I like, like I, I love the, the fact that I get to work at Goddard and I like amongst all of these scientists and I can, you know, go knock on any doors and be like, Hey, I'm interested in what you're working on. Um, I love that part. Um, but I probably right now it's just the exciting part about getting to be a part of history and doing, uh, being a part of the space weather team for Artemis is pretty cool. So I feel like that's, that's pretty awesome. Nerve wracking, but awesome. I really <laughs> hope I don't end up being the person saying, Hey, sorry, there's a solar event going on. Can't launch. Like, <laughs> I don't want to be that person. <laughs> sure. Yeah. There is pressure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending the ambassador meeting.